There are two types of information in our cells. One we hear a lot about, it's our DNA, the genetic code, and that's a digital format, four letters, A, T, C, G. And that's pretty stable during life. What we've learned in just in the last five or so years is that there's another level of information that is not as stable. And we call this the epigenome. And you can think of the epigenome as the parts of the cell that read the digital genetic information, much in the way a DVD encodes music, and then the reader, which in this case is the epigenome, is reading that music. And we think what's going on during aging, perhaps in large part, is that the reader doesn't do a good job. And even though the music of our lives, of our youth, is still in the cell, the cell just doesn't read those genes in the right way. But really, that their main function is to tell cells how to behave from being an embryo all the way through to death. The epigenome is these chemical marks, which we call methyls, laid down very soon after fertilization, when we're just a, a, you know, a newly merged sperm and egg. And as the cells divide, they specialize. Of course, you need to build a brain and a liver and, a, and skin. And these chemicals, these methyls, are laid down in different patterns to assign the cell type. And that's how you build an eye, that's how you build a liver. The problem we think during aging is that that beautiful pattern that's there when we're born eventually fades away and the brain and the liver and the skin forget to function like they did when we were young. You're talking about the cutting edge of science right now. The question really is, do these chemical marks that are laid down when we're young, do they really have a function during aging? Are they responsible for diseases? Are they responsible for diabetes, cancer, even blindness? And you can read these, of course. We can say, okay, somebody with that pattern is probably 85 years old, even though their birthday is 75 years, candles wise. And the question is, is that person literally older biologically? And we think they are because these patterns that predict your age, if you're older than your birthday candles would suggest, you typically have a shorter lifespan. And if you've smoked and you haven't exercised and you've become obese through most of your life, you get this accelerated aging pattern. But what I was proposing and have proposed in my book in a recent paper we published in Nature is that that clock that we're measuring may not just be a clock on the wall, it may actually govern time. It may govern our age. And the best test of that is to change the clock and see what happens. Well, it used to be theoretical. Our recent work that we published in Nature in December shows that it is actually possible. We used a three gene combination. These three genes are normally turned on in embryos when we're very young, but as we get older, we don't turn these genes on. They're silenced, as we call it. And the question that we had was if we turn on these early embryonic genes in an adult animal, in this case, we use old mice that were blind, among other things, but we looked at their eyes specifically, can you reset use those genes to reset the age of the eye. And if you do that, does anything happen? And what we discovered to our delight was that we could not just turn back the clock, but time went back. The age of the eye went backwards and the mice got their vision back. And that was, I would say, probably the highlight of my career so far over, over 30 years of research. It's what I've been trying to yell from the rooftops for at least a couple of decades now, that we tend to think of aging as something that is inevitable and natural and therefore acceptable. And I'm, I'm saying that aging is actually a medical condition. It's a very common one, but it's also treatable. And we're not just talking about gene therapies that I've just referred to. There are at least two dozen companies around the world developing medicines that could either slow down or in some cases reverse the age of organs and perhaps one day the entire body. So it's not out of the realms of biology. And it's certainly within I think within many of our lifetimes that we will see the ability to be prescribed a medicine that would protect you not just against one disease, but against all major diseases that aging causes. In fact, 85% of diseases in the developed world are caused by aging. The other amazing thing is you could imagine that you get your body reset every decade or so by your doctor, by these treatments, and then you just age out again and you keep repeating that process. Because when people say, oh, we've reached our maximum lives, that we cannot live much longer than this, all you have to do is point to other species that live much longer than us, that have evolved or currently exist, that they're at the top of the food chain and they've been able to put more of their resources into building a, a long-lived body. We typically only survived till about 40 or 50 years of age before we had civilization, and our bodies are not built 
to live longer because that's a waste of energy. Whereas if you look at a whale, a bowhead whale can live a few hundred years and they're basically cousins of ours, biologically speaking. And there are trees that live thousands of years. So what I, I'm trying to say here is that there is no biological law that says that we, that we have to die at 100 or even at, at 120. And that by learning from these other species and giving ourselves the benefit of youth, we can push off getting sick, not just for a few years, but perhaps decades, and live really healthy, productive lives up until the very end.